Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here. It's good to be with you. Um, greetings from Rochester, New York. Um, I don't know who from Rochester would say hi other than my family maybe, but good morning. Um, it is good to be with you uh, this morning. And the title of this message I've called Seasons. Uh, we go through different seasons in life. There are certainly times where um, we are on top of the world, where we have those mountaintop experiences, and then there are times where we feel like we are in the valley of the shadow of craziness, craziness and chaos and darkness. And um, What's interesting to me is how when you look at the landscape throughout a mountainous terrain, if you ever have the chance to go up on top of a mountain, um, there's not a lot of life in the mountain, um, on top of the mountain. In fact, things kind of get a little bit more cold, callous, hard, difficult. Try climbing the White Face Mountain, and that becomes a, uh, a, a very difficult challenge. Now, for me, um, I have a friend that just completed his 46th high peak in the Adirondacks. Uh, what that equates to is there are 46 peaks that are above the 4,000 foot level up in the Adirondacks, and his last peak was um, White Face Mountain, and he finished it on Columbus Day weekend, kind of like a day like today, where it's 50 degrees outside, sunny, and White Face Mountain also happens to be a peak that you can drive up. Um, no, he didn't cheat. He didn't drive up, but his family was able to meet him at the top, at the summit, as he finished. And when you're on top of the mountain, you have a glorious view um, where you can see for miles and miles and miles. But then you look down in the valley, and that's where life is. That's where there's uh, water, sustenance, movement, activity. But it's oftentimes short term, where you can't see the many, many miles that you can see on top of the mountain. Personally, for me, there are times where I read and where I study scripture, and I'm just blown away with encouragement. I'm feeling like I'm zoned in, filled with hope, and everything being right on point. I don't know if that's where you're at with engaging scripture sometimes, or engaging time alone with the Lord, uh, but I can tell you that, um, especially early on in my walk with Jesus, uh, there were constant mountaintop or benchmark moments that I can recall where God just grounded me more and more in a, in a good way. And I was excited to be spending that time with him. Other times, it's not the case. I oftentimes in those seasons of life become more introspective, thinking, all right, well, what am I struggling with? What's this blockade for me experiencing this mountaintop moment again. Sometimes overthinking is what happens next. Now take Isaiah 42 as an example for this. Diving in and reading and studying and preparing for this message. That was very much in preparation for this message, my thinking. I didn't necessarily feel like I was on point with the Lord, but I felt like, all right, God, why are you and I not clicking or vibing or connecting in this way that I'm so used to? And the temptation when we go through times like this, the temptation is to just kind of breeze through it or give some sort of Christian cliche or, or pat answer. Amherst Church, can I be vulnerable and real honest with you for a moment? Is that all right? Okay, two of you agree. All right, so here, here you go. Guys and ladies, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with a lot of uncertainty today. Constant changing times, more pivot points, government mandates this and rules for that. It's hard to wonder what's coming next. I almost wonder when the next shoe is going to fall. Whatever cliche you want to use in that. I'm struggling. And for me personally, at times it feels like the call into ministry just isn't enough. The risk of being vulnerable is people don't always know how to handle it. <laughs> they don't know how to take it. Many times they don't know how to respond to it. I teach at Roberts Wesleyan College, and I was very vulnerable with my class this week. And many of the students were kind of like, oh, some of 
of them appreciated it. Instead of just going through the motions of the classroom activity, going through the lesson, going through the materials. But I kind of shared with them a piece of my heart, and many of them didn't necessarily know how to respond because that wasn't normal for them. The reward of vulnerability, we find a bunch of broken and humble people leaning into God more along the way. And I, I tend to think Isaiah was like this. Did he struggle? Absolutely. Was he humble and broken? You betcha. Was he vulnerable at times? Yes, absolutely. And I think this theme continues on in chapter 42. So let's read the entire chapter. It's 25 verses. We're going to work through it and then break it down just a little bit. And find how it relates to the different seasons of life that we seem to go through. Is that fair? Would you pray with me? And then we'll dive into reading God's Word uh, together. God, thanks for today. And thank you for this lovely opportunity to read your Word. I, I, I thank you, Lord, that it is very much like opening your mouth and hearing directly from you. I thank you that your Word is really your love letter to us. Your continued desire to have a relationship with us, even when we push back or don't know how to respond. God, I pray that you would be with the reading of your word today as we uh, struggle through it, as we work through it. I pray that conviction would come where that's needed. I pray too, Lord, that encouragement would come as well where that might be needed. Lord, you know the needs that are represented here. You know how much your word um, can transform and, and how your blood covers over a multitude of sin as your word declares. So Lord, as we as we look into this more, help us to be refined at the core of who we are, knowing full well, God, that you are the one who is sovereign, you change and transform, and you use your word to do so. Thank you for this time to be able to be refined by your word. We pray this in your name, and together we say, amen. All right, starting at verse 1, reading it today out of the New Living Translation. It reads as follows in verse 1. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the uh, weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. Verse 5, continuing on. God the Lord created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. He gives breath to everyone, life to everyone who walks the earth. And it is he who says, I the Lord have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. Verses 8 and 9 now. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else, nor share my praise with carved idols. Everything I prophesied has come true, and now I will prophesy again. I will tell you the future before it happens. Continuing on in verse 10. Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing his praises from the ends of the earth. Sing all you who sail the seas, all you who live in distant coastlands. Join in the chorus, you desert towns. Let the villages of Kedar rejoice. Let the people of Selah sing for joy. Shout praises from the mountaintops. Let the whole world glorify the Lord. Let it sing his praise. The Lord will march forth like a mighty hero. He will come out like a warrior full of fury. He will shout his battle cry and crush all his enemies. He will say, I have long been silent. Yes, I have restrained myself. But now, like a woman in labor, I will cry and groan and pant. I will level the mountains and hills and blight all their greenery. I will turn the rivers into dry land 
and will dry up all the pools. I will lead blind Israel down a new path, guiding them along an unfamiliar way. I will brighten the darkness before them and smooth out the road ahead of them. Yes, I will indeed do these things. I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols, who say, you are our gods, will be turned away in shame. Verses 18 through 25. Listen, you who are deaf, look and see, you blind. Who is as blind as my own people, my servant? Who is as deaf as my messenger? Who is as blind as my chosen people, the servant of the Lord? You see and recognize what is right, but refuse to act on it. You hear with your own ears, but you don't really listen. Because he is righteous. The Lord has exalted his glorious law. But his own people have been robbed and plundered, enslaved, imprisoned, and trapped. They are a fair game for anyone and have no one to protect them, no one to take them back home. Verse 23. Who will hear these lessons from the past and see the ruin that awaits you in the future? Who allowed Israel to be robbed and hurt? It was the Lord against whom we've sinned. For the people would not walk in his path, nor would they obey his law. Therefore he poured out his fury on them and destroyed them in battle. They were engulfed in flames, but they still refused to understand. They were consumed by fire, but they did not learn their lesson. It's a reading of God's word this morning. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, there are three distinct sections that we see at work in this passage. And verses 1 through 9 speak to uh, a certain kernel of truth, a certain element of truth. Verses 11, sorry, check that. Verses 10 through 17 are another section that talk about praises. And then verses 18 through 25 are the third and final section that really talk about deliverance. That outlines where we are going to spend the next few minutes of our time talking about this passage. Now, in the first section, verses 1 through 9, it points to the one and coming Messiah, Jesus. The one who is coming down, stepping out of heaven to take on our sting, to take on our sin, to take on all temptation before him, but without sin himself. But it also points back to creation and godly promises. Now I get it. There's going to be times where we aren't quote unquote feeling it. And this passage is rich with symbolism. This passage is rich with um, different truths and theological elements. And even when reading through it, you can hear some of the, the different expressions that are shared, especially in verses 1 through 9. And Jesus truly is at the center point of all things in the Old Testament pointing to our need for him and all things in the New Testament pointing back to the fact of what he did. He is truly the center point. Not just a hero, but Savior, Messiah, sustainer of all things. And again, there's going to be times where we are not feeling it. Sometimes the answer we hear, the old Christian cliche, might be something along these lines. Well, Jesus still loves you. And there's truth in that. But sometimes we just don't necessarily need to hear that. Because that's not where we are dialed in. Maybe we are going through crazy situations where the summary of the events or the circumstances that we face don't necessarily point to the reality that Jesus does love. And being reminded of that when we are walking through that only hurts more. If you can't tell, I'm speaking from personal experiences right now. Situationally, personally for me, over the last several years, if I really take a look and dive in, I find some deep-seated trauma that happened in my, in my heart, in my life, that has been coming to the surface more and more these last couple years. Things that I'm now willing to acknowledge that I have bottled up for so long. And sometimes this call doesn't seem enough. 
But when we walk through this, personally for me, I find leaning into godly promises and having a foundational theology is what continues to carry me. I don't need to be reminded that Jesus loves me. I know it inside, even when my circumstances tell me that I'm not loved. His faithfulness continues to carry. And that's what we find in the elements of verses 1 through 9 that point back to the fact that he created everything. And he allowed all of creation to have breath, as it says right in the middle of that passage. So it points back to these godly promises that we can hold on to even when the circumstances of life are difficult, even when we are walking through the valley of uncertainty, the Spirit loves. Just like there is the certainty factor that when a cell phone is on, <laughs> typically a call is going to come through. Am I right? Oh, you're fine. It happens. Cell phones ring. And it just points to the reality of, again, God will show up at the right time and he's already there. Even in our lowest of lows. It's in this place where we find we can be vulnerable. It's in this place where we can find where we can work through it with him. In his way and in his will. My goal is... Personally, when I go through seasons like this, when I'm not feeling it, is to have a willingness to say, yes, Lord, even when I don't want to. And I love verses 1 through 9 because, again, it points back to the reality of the creation story as we see towards the end of uh, verses 7, 8, and 9. And again, in the first part, it points to the need of Jesus and what he's going to be doing. And how he creates and sustains everything. Amen? Isn't that awesome? So moving on, we see in verses 10 through 17, a, a call to worship and rejoice. Now my problem when it comes to worship is this. I think that worship has to look a specific way. My way. The way that I've been ingrained. The way that I express myself. I think, well, everybody has to express themselves the same way. No. Right? Some people worship in different ways. Some people take a posture, a physical posture that sits. Some people take a physical posture that kneels. Some people take a physical posture that stands and raises their hands as high as they possibly can go. And it's not about the way or the how of what we do for worship. It's about the who. Oh, by the way, sometimes we confuse the word worship with the word music. Worship is also our response to God's word. Worship is our posture in our hearts in how we approach the Lord in every season of life. Sometimes there's a new song on our heart. Sometimes there's just groaning. Ugh. Sometimes we don't even know how to express our hearts and what's going on on the inside because of hurt and pain. And then all of a sudden our worship may even take on a different life in and of itself than how we are used to or are personally accustomed to worship. How I worship now, on my way down here today, I listened to a soundtrack from a uh, docudrama called The Heart of Man. Um, it's by the soundtrack is by Tony Anderson, and if you have, um, it's all instrumental. It's beautiful, and The Heart of Man is a docudrama that is a um, a creatively licensed play on the prodigal son, if I can say that right. Um, and interspersed within this film are interviews with people that have been abused abused others, or a combination thereof. And as I'm listening to this deep music, and as I'm on my way here, I'm just praying and crying out to the Lord on the way here. Just saying, Lord, you're beautiful, you're awesome. Becoming more introspective. 
worship, our response is going to be ultimately to walk in obedience to the Lord. And the subject of our obedience is ultimately Him. Does it express itself through song? Absolutely. Does worship express itself through um, the reading of His Word and responding to it? Absolutely. Some people are going to sit silently and just journal or take mental notes or be singing the loudest note that they can possibly sing with their hands expressed high. There are times where worship, rejoicing, where it's refreshing, and then in other seasons of life, it's going to be like wrestling with the Lord. And guess what? Who would you rather wrestle with? If you're struggling, if you're going through difficulty, I'd rather wrestle with the Lord than anyone else. And guess what? He's big enough to be able to handle it. <laughs> Sometimes worship is exciting and vibrant. Sometimes it's reverent and quiet. For me, I put myself and others down when it seemed like my worship wasn't good enough. Or others' worship wasn't quote-unquote good enough. And so that middle section, verses 10 through 17, really express worship. Rejoicing. And we are going to express ourselves in different ways. Let's look at this last section that talks about deliverance. Now, I've had deliverance before. I can tell you story after story of things that God has delivered me from. Sometimes instantaneous. Sometimes it's been a journey. Sometimes it's happened over time. And in some cases, we're still working through it. It's like God is sanding me down, refining me more and more and more from some different elements of my past and different elements of what he's preparing me for in my future. I've had deliverance. You, as a follower of Jesus Christ, have had deliverance from the, from the jaws of death. You've been delivered. Amen? That's awesome. That's exciting. We don't have to continue to be ensnared in that entrapment. But I still continue to need it. Sometimes I blow it. Sometimes I mess up. But I need to lean into his perfection and his unique qualities because I still haven't dialed it all in. I get it. We are becoming more and more like Christ each and every day for those of you who are followers of Jesus. And within this realm of deliverance, we have a, a, a better understanding of our sin and how wretched our sin is. A wretched man that I am, as Paul likes to declare in his uh, letter to the Romans. And the ultimate pathway it leads to, where sin and its pathway lead to, separation, death, destruction, despair. But we also understand and have a better sensitivity to knowing that sin impacts and hurts and divides in our relationships today. In verse 21, let me read verse 21 to you again. Because he is righteous, the Lord has exalted his glorious law. Jesus, my friends, is righteous. By definition, he is what is right standing with the Father. Tempted in every way, yet in and of himself without sin. He is the perfect sacrifice. He allows us to not only be covered in his blood, but he also transforms us. As if the covering weren't enough. It would have been, but wait, there's more. He makes you new, and he makes me new as he continues to refine more and more deliverance is poured out. This transformation allows us to be new, it allows us to be whole, it allows us to no longer live as a victim, but as one who has victory in Jesus' name. The God of peace 
will soon crush Satan. Where? Underneath our feet. Oh, that's awesome, isn't it? Here's the danger with sanctification. There's a danger with it? Well, yeah, there can be. If we get to a place where we think that we are sanctified, maybe, just maybe, our attitude changes this way, where we lose our neediness. Another danger, losing our first love. Another danger, forgetting that deliverance continues. Guys and ladies, these qualities still need to happen today, long after we might be sanctified through and through. It still continues to happen. I am a needy person. There's the vulnerability right there. An expression from one pastor who's been ordained in the Church of the Nazarene for, golly, 12 years now? I had to do some quick math there. I'm still needy. I don't have it all figured out. I don't have all the pat church answers. Well, I do. But I don't want to use those anymore. I'm tired of those. Yes, I'm righteous because of the blood. You're righteous because of the blood and his continual work that includes this deliverance. However, my ego and my pride get in the way. Ego and pride doesn't belong as part of the sanctifying work of the original element of Jesus in the first place that saves and the continued work of the Holy Spirit that sanctifies. Pride and ego are not allowed. I can't lay claim to the fact that I sanctify myself. The only thing I did was say, yes, Lord. Do your thing. Then get out of the way. And there is no ego, there is no pride in that reality. Guys and ladies, we need to park our ego. And I'm right there with you, saying this to myself. I need to park the ego I need to park the pride. And sometimes when we go down that road of sanctification and talking about it and discussing it, it leads to a pride-filled answer. Oh, I'm perfect in Jesus' name. I can't tell you how many times I heard that from uh, when I was youth pastoring. The attitude behind that, am I judging? Probably. <laughs> Sorry. But the attitude behind that, those words are basically saying, I have no more need for. We need to be more needy now than ever before. Full disclosure again. My attitude has been such a turnoff for me at times as a minister of the gospel that maybe, just maybe, it has driven people away. We need freedom. And people are looking for it. People in your workplaces, they're looking for it. Your neighbors are looking for it. They may not know how to express it. They may not know how to... Um, Describe it, but they are looking for freedom. In times of uncertainty, more and more people are looking for freedom. You look at the rush of what's happened in the last two years. Let's respond to freedom from COVID by flattening the curve in two weeks. Just kidding. Hey, let's respond to freedom by everybody, let's push that vaccine. Oh, wait, 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 that's not enough now. Let's keep pushing more for, for the next round, the next cycle. Please understand, I'm not trying to take a position on any of these. But it's the dangling carrot. 
that people are constantly going after, like putting it in front of a horse. I'm almost there. The only one that brings complete freedom is Jesus. That's it. And I need to continue to express to the Lord my need for his presence in my life and his work. I'm almost done. We need freedom, and it starts with acknowledging need and being delivered. And that's the beauty of who the Lord is and what he does. The delivery comes. And it happens sometimes, again, immediately, and sometimes it takes time to unfold. So today, in the introduction, I shared with you that I'm not always feeling it. There's different seasons of life. I've shared with you and expressed with you that I've read and studied scripture in preparation for sermons here in the past where it's been right on. And then there are other times, like in preparation, reading through Isaiah 42, where it's like, man, I, I wrestle with this one. Lord, what's going on? And there are seasons and times that we are very much like that. Sometimes those seasons last way longer than we anticipate or expect. Where maybe, just maybe, we're like, okay, Lord, when's it coming? When are we going to have that on-top experience again? Sometimes we're not always feeling it. The first point, the first section, today we looked at, again, pointing to Jesus. Developing a, a healthy theology that can carry us through those dark times. That's important because we aren't always going to feel it. Having some, again, foundational elements to theology, some foundational elements to the fact that, yeah, Jesus does love you, but God created everything. God gives breath to everything. He also sustains things through his Son and through his Holy Spirit. And remembering to plug into some of those theological attributes that will carry us through those dark times, that is huge. I cannot express that enough. The second thing that we looked at, verses 10 through 17, that worship, it's going to look different for each person. It's more about the who than the how. Right? The who of our worship is more important than how it's expressed. Third point was deliverance continues. Including from our own spiritual prideful hearts. Deliverance continues. Lord, help us if we go down that road of becoming modern-day Pharisee. And then this wrap-up. Let's continue to recognize our neediness. Being sensitive to his deliverance in us. And how that deliverance is like a domino effect. And is ultimately meant to be passed towards others. Amen? Amen. We need deliverance. And our world needs deliverance. And that only comes by being in a relationship with the Lord God Almighty through his son Jesus, who covers us with his blood and transforms us by the way of his Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for Amherst Church. And I thank you for those that are here, those that are watching from afar. Lord, we don't always know how to be vulnerable. And maybe just maybe you need to take us back to that time where we first surrendered. Where we gave you our hearts and lives. Maybe just maybe there might be some that haven't fully surrendered. God, I pray today for those that may need this encouragement, that may be going through seasons where they don't necessarily know how to express their, the vulnerability that you're, that you're developing inside. God, I pray that we would be people that learn how to express our vulnerability, express our neediness for you. That we don't have it all figured out, but man, we can plug into the one who does. But Lord, forgive us for those times. Forgive me for those times where my spiritual pride has been a turnoff to the gospel for those that I've been around. God, I pray for those that 
don't yet know you in my world and in the worlds of everyone that's represented in this room and from afar. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that again, this, this humility that you have called us to would be expressed in such a way through vulnerability where people will be willing to come to you, Lord Jesus, because of the work that you're doing inside of us. So continue to deliver. Allow us to live life in the valley when we are going through those seasons. And allow us to rejoice when we are on top of the mountain. And to keep pressing forward in the journey of deliverance that you're doing inside of each and every one of us. Thanks, God. We pray this in your name. Together we say, Amen. Amen. Guys and ladies, I, uh, that is an, it's an honor and a privilege to, to be with you today and again. Thank you for allowing me to bring God's word. Um, let's go this week as people who are called to be delivered and live in his way, which is far beyond our own abilities by ourselves. Amen? Amen. Go get him. Have a great week.